welcome everyone to uh, this week's edition of the Friday Talk of Society 2045. It's a group of people with a, um, a vision that in 2045 that our world uh, will be uh, different in many ways than it is at the present time. And we have determined that one of the best ways uh, to get the word out is to um, interview in these Friday talks individuals that um, share a, a similar vision for 2045, uh, but in, in different ways. And it's my special privilege uh, today to be talking to um, Ayelet Barron, uh, establishing her own clear vision and now doing some amazing work in the world. So uh, Ayelet, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you back from Spain, where you've been for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's great to see you and everybody here. And I'm looking forward to a conversation because that's the society we're moving towards is more connecting, more dialogue and tapping into timeless wisdom and timeless technologies. And it's amazing. I love technology, um, digital technology as well, because we're able to be here to have these conversations. So I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody as well and really creating together what's possible. Great. Um, we'll go for about 35 or 40 minutes. I'll just mostly be prompting and, and asking questions. And it's about you sharing what your vision is. So because it's so interesting, um, I don't want you to spend too much time on it, but if you would just share a little bit about, um, you know, your background and the journey that has brought you this place, uh, to this place. And, and mostly, um, I'd love you to just talk about what your vision for society uh, will be in 2045 and what are the activities that you're engaged in to bring about that vision and, and make it a reality? Well, the bottom line is the future is the future is human. Um, that is the bottom line, is that we get seduced and trapped by progress and all these beliefs that we have. But the future is human if we decide and we remember that we are powerful creators. And what I'm working on is helping um, us remember that when we step into our power and own who we are and are passionate about what, why we're here and what we're here creating, which is why I love um, the Radical Purpose uh, group as well, because it's all about knowing why you're here and, and creating meaning together. And for me, um, I fired myself from corporate America in, um, I don't remember what year it was, but uh, <laughs> um, but a while ago, and uh, I was on a very um, typical track that many of us were on, uh, working in high tech in the Silicon Valley. Um, I was traveling like crazy. I was so important, um, or so I believed. Um, and um, I ticked the boxes on almost everything. And it wasn't easy as a woman as well, because I worked mostly globally and internationally. While I lived in the Bay Area, I was traveling most of the time. And I spent time on the executive team for emerging markets. I spent time on the executive team for Canada and other areas. But most of my work was global. And even though we were a technology company, um, I was traveling all the time, which was ironic. And uh, I was bringing in ways for us to use our technology. So you know, actually what's happened in the last two years were things I was working on in the late 90s. Um, I even launched our first online community in 1999 internally um, because I really strongly believe in community and it failed, but I learned a ton about it, about how we build communities moving forward as well. So um, it's really um, exciting to have that background. And I feel really um, lucky and blessed to have been in some of these um, situations and positions. Um, I loved working in emerging markets. I loved connecting with people in different parts of the world. I worked in over a hundred countries. But before that, um, I actually, uh, my dream was always to be a writer. Um, and somehow I, find, I found myself um, auditioning when I finished high school um, for theater. I, I got really involved in theater um, in my teens. Um, I have been moving and living in different countries um, from the time I was born. So when people ask me, where are you from? I tell them it's complicated. 
and then they say, well, where were you born? And I say, it has nothing to do with anything. And then they say, well, where did you grow up? And I say, well, I haven't, I don't want to grow up. Who wants to grow up? So, <laughs> so my story would probably take about 35 minutes, so I won't get into it. But um, for me, um, I, I fired myself and then um, I had some medical issues because I was on a plane that uh, <laughs> that's a story in itself. And I had a real reckoning about why am I here? What do I want to do? And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is I don't want more people to fire themselves. I want us to create organizations that matter. I want us to create lives that matter. I want us to live um, in harmony with nature. And in 2014, I went on a trip I never imagined going on um, to the to Ecuador with a group of 17 women. Um, we went to the Amazon to look at maternal health. And that was a life-changing um, trip for me because I realized how separated we were in the Western culture from uh, nature and that we forgot that we're a part of nature, that we do not need to detox from ourselves, or sometimes we do, but this whole separation that we created, this whole story about how we're so innovative and so amazing um, was one that was really creating a lot of suffering and I was always fascinated by culture because at the root of culture is cult. And, um, you know, I did a search this morning um, about culture consulting and I found over 750 million um, uh, hits on that. And yet, if you look at it, we still struggle with this notion of culture. We're still very divided and separated. And my vision is that I know if someone is in the emerging timeline or in the current mainstream timeline, whether they're still fighting, whether they're still competing, whether they're still dividing. And every time I see someone say, we are winning, um, my first memory in life is war. I was three years old when war broke out in the country I lived and I, didn't realize at the time that if my side lost, I wouldn't be here talking to all of you um, because war is real. And um, it showed me how community, how people come together during a time of crisis. And so my, my focus has always been about how do we connect with each other heart to heart? How do we find common ground? How do we understand that we did not come to this planet to suffer? We came here to create. We came here to play. We came here to, to live. And what we've done is we've created machines of misery. We've created suffering. And we are so powerful. That's what I learned in the Amazon is I sat there and I questioned everything. And I said, wait a second. There are tons of philosophies and thinking about who created the earth, who created the sun, who created plants, who created us, but there's not one source that we could go to and say, this is how it happened. But when we looked at business, when we looked at education, when we looked at taxes, when we looked at marriage, these are all structures that we humans created and this is how powerful we are. So my question to all of us is, if we are so powerful, why are we not creating the systems that serve the vast majority of humanity, not the few? And that's where I see us going. I see us saying, okay, enough. We don't wanna fight anymore. There's no reason to compete. One of my favorite um, uh, shares from Jose, um, has been that we're all working on the same thing and we're all working on pieces of the same thing. And to me, that is so profound because as I meet and connect with new people, I right away see if they want to work on the same jigsaw puzzle that we're putting together about creating a healthy world with healthy systems. And if they're not, I am like, okay, that's fantastic. If you want to keep fighting, if you want to keep Doing that stuff, it's great. I'm not here to sell or convince you, but this chapter in my life is focused on really not even giving back because like I think giving back is also a construct that we created that is really arrogant. 
And when I worked in, in Africa and when I met with young people in places like Kibera, you know, the arrogance of us coming in thinking that we have the answers without sitting down and asking the youth what they need and, and where they are. And when you do sit with them, you find that they're in a totally different place because all they want to do is be listened to. And there's so many amazing pioneers right now in the world. Um, I think about 7% of the 8 billion people on the planet are on this path and um, are creating the healthy systems, whether it's regenerative agriculture, whether it's education, whatever it is, whether it's business. And what I'd love to do uh, to see for society 2045 is not just the future of work or future of law or future of business, I want to see the future of humanity, you know, how, how do we, I believe right now we're the least intelligent species on this planet. And I'll stop here. Beautiful. So you've got me creating a wonderful word salad over here, in terms of in terms of notes in terms of touch points that you that you've hit. Talk a little bit about um, I would, if you would what your vision is for 2045. I mean, you've touched on words like culture and human and um, no more suffering and um, moving away from the word winning, by the way, which I couldn't agree with you more. When I hear people talk about winning, it's kind of like everybody has adopted this whole sports metaphor, which is driving us a, a, a little bit nuts. So talk a little bit about what, what your vision is for 2045 and what you're doing to bring about that vision. So I'm not sure if I'm going to see in my lifetime what I'm doing. I feel like I'm planting seeds in, in the garden. You know, I might look like I'm in my 20s, but I'm not. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the prompts on my desk is no seed ever sees the flower. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. OK, yeah, mm -hmm. my, my my vision is not a I, I believe the next five years are foundational. I'm more focused on um, navigating the next five years and looking at 2027 as a real turning point for, for 2045. And I say that because, you know, for me, 2022 is the year of choices and discernment. And what I mean by that is that we live in, in so many options, so many opportunities, and we're focused on problems. So I see a world where more and more of us, instead of trying to solve problems every day, we look at a problem and say, what's the opportunity? If you look at the, S the United Nations STG goals, they're all focused on um, solving humanity's biggest problems. And if anyone's delusional, think that by their year, they're going to solve poverty and access to water and whatever the other, you know, 15 S um, goals are, um, we're, we're totally delusional. I would like to see a world where we get together and we say, we are creating and we are, we are here to look at these opportunities and what is possible. And so in that world, when you look at education, you, you don't look at indoctrination. Um, you know, there's some amazing people in India right now that are looking at self-learning and unlearning. And, you know, this, this young, uh, amazing 26-year-old guy who read one of my blogs um, connected uh, with this group in India, and now they're working together. And that's one of the things that I see right now is that there's less talking and, and lecturing and, and looking at things and people are really connecting to, based on their purpose to find it. And, you know, what amazing thing to do is to wake up in the morning and get a WhatsApp message from, from Jeffrey who says, hey, I connected because I saw this. He took the initiative to reach out to this person and now I'm helping to build a platform for young people so they can learn in a different way. And the same thing, like when you think about it and health and, um, and uh, wellness, looking at alternatives, understanding that there's other ways of, of, of healing and taking care holistically of ourselves and not separating and dividing ourselves. And so our ability to look at all these systems that we can create, and we all talk about the future of work, but we don't know what work is anymore. Are we all working right now? Is this considered work? But we're all predicting what the future of it is and we're leading way too much with structure versus what we want to create. 
And, you know, I'm really blessed right now to be working um, with a couple of amazing pioneers and visionaries in the world and creating a, a platform that connects us. And so, and, and it's funny because the old me who worked in tech would have been rushing through it, but we've been running a couple of experiments to look at the human dynamics of it and see, okay, how do we bring this to life? How do we birth it? And so hopefully in the next six months, you'll start seeing um, um, some things coming from, from our space as well, because again, we don't want to do a lot of the hype of it. We, we want to connect. And my dream is that we have a parallel universe online where we can find each other. So the 7% of the 8 billion people um, can, you know, we could find, we could find our products and services. We can find things that are healthy and are not killing the environment. We can, um, talk to each other. Like right now, what I'm finding is a lot of people want to want to set up time and are feeling alone and isolated. And there's no place to really find each other. And then people are trying to create more and more layering over it where we have to cut through the bullshit and remember that things could be very simple. So my vision for our future is for us to be more human, <laughs> um, to figure out how we can lift each other up, um, but start with lifting ourselves up, which is why I wrote the Fuck the Bucket List trilogy, um, because it wasn't about saying, you know, fuck the bucket list. Um, it was about saying, if you have a bucket list, are the items on that list your own? Or are these things that people put in your mind that you must do during your lifetime? And if they are not your own, what is your own um, purpose? Why are you here? And you know, it's funny when I wrote the books, I thought I was writing one book and then I ended up um, finishing the draft and giving it to a couple of people um, of all ages. And one woman told me this was like reading a binoculars for my soul. And, but there's way too much here. And I had saved um, it as three files and I realized I had three books. And so right now I, I wanna be able to offer these books. And again, if somebody can't afford the books I'm happy to send PDFs to people because the books are all about stepping into your power and owning your power and, and it's personal and no one has your answers. No one's coming to save us. Um, this whole notion of, of being saved is, is ridiculous in, in my opinion and something that in 2045 we won't have because we will be living in, in much different ways and going back to timeless wisdom and timeless technologies. Beautiful. Couple of things I wanna I wanna drill down on. Um, one, I just want I just want to say that that the, the the trilogy that you wrote it's just got such a wonderful ring to it. Fuck the bucket list, and I and I, and I love the thinking behind it. But it sounds to me like um, at its essence, what you want to do is change people's thinking, um, is change people's being by getting at their thinking. You know, could you say a little bit more about uh, about that? And I know you do a daily, a, a, you know, amazing that you're producing what you do every single day. But each day is is filled with a with a wonderful nugget for people. So could you say a little bit of, uh, more about what your intention is with those? I think I'm personally frustrating frustrated with the book publishing industry. You know, um, and. It's, it's, I want to make thinking available to people. And so I thought, what can I do? And um, I remember when I first left my corporate job, I met this speaker agent and I said to her, you know, I really want to blog daily. And she said to me, who the hell do you think you are? Do you think you're Seth Godin? What do you have to say every day? <laughs> and um, <laughs> now I could laugh about it. Um, and then when I, my first book came out, Our Journey to Corporate Sanity, which really looked at conscious leadership in 2016, um, I did a daily blog um, on 365 days of, of sanity, and then I didn't blog for a while. And then um, these three books came out in 18 months, and I wrote them in partnership with my co-author, The Universe. 
and I have put my trust in in the universe and and universal knowledge um, because it's it's any one of us is writing this. It's just some of us are are actually <laughs> bringing it out, and. I want to profile um, people who are doing radical trucking and, and looking at things from that way, but it's been fun. I actually don't want to write books anymore. I love, I love this and I love to have more conversations. I mean, don't, don't hold me if I do, but I, I just really don't want to go through the process of, of the publishing until, until we create a, 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 a healthier way to get our books to people. Uh, because once, once the, the books get to the people who need them, they're like medicine for the soul. But to get through the noise of the systems that we built, it's, 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 it's crushing for, for an author. Um, and I'm sure other people on this may have different perspectives, but you know, like I don't want to spend my life marketing. So if, if I can write every day and somebody reads just one once a month, that's fine. Um, and we're repurposing the posts for other things that we, we're creating um, with this platform that we're building. So it's like we're, I'm working on the same things at once without having to think about it um, in, in a separate way and looking at things holistically. So again, it's, it's about um, instigating and inspiring us to move away from misery and suffering and for people in organizations to understand that leadership is not outside ourselves. We don't need followers. We don't need likes. Um, I don't want to be influenced. I don't want to be brainwashed. Um, I stepped out of that reality. Um, but I still see many people around me caught in that mind. You know, yesterday, um, I, I've become a digital nomad. I, 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 I left um, my place in, in May and gave away 93% uh, of my things. And every day I'm rewiring myself. And the reason you see this background here on this call right now is because I'm in a hotel trying to figure out where I'm gonna be in a week because I don't have a place yet. And so I am trekking into the unknown. I, have, I wrote a book about trekking into the unknown. I wrote a book about trusting your heart and I'm living it. And I'm not writing or saying anything that I wouldn't do myself. And can you talk a little bit about the platform that you've, you've, you know, you're in process of creating and what your vision is for that and how that's going to impact the world? So it's gone through transformations because we've been experimenting. But the goal is to help people go on their own individual self-trek. It's about purposeful trekking and um, connecting heart to heart with people. So part of it is we're building tracks for people to find out what your heartbeat. So for example, on the platform, instead of having a profile, like I live here, um, I like, um, you know, I like to ski, I'm bald, uh, I have hair, whatever category that you want to classify yourself with, what we're asking people is, what is your heartbeat? And what is, what are you creating? And so people will have profiles there about what we care about and who we are. But in the process, you know, many of these questions, people have a hard time answering because we're answering it ourselves now. Like we're, we're saying, okay, um, we're not just going to create this and have everybody else answer it, but we're going to answer it ourselves. And, um, and, and we're going to experiment it with ourselves. And this is what the profile will be, uh, will be what's your heartbeat. And we've got some people who are also musicians on board. And I thought it would be fascinating if we got different tones and we could see if, if people are connecting to it. But ultimately, if you are, if you are, if you have a, a challenge or a problem or an opportunity, you can easily find other people and be able to uh, jump on a creation pod and be able to connect with other people. And there's also um, a part of this that is about um, finding trusted sources, which many on this call are, where we would um, bring in your products, your services, and say, here's kind of 
all this stuff that you didn't know uh, was just waiting for you here to connect with in a marketplace. And we're looking for people to partner with it. And so I'm always talking to people and trying to understand what they're doing, because if they're doing it already, we don't want to do it. And so we want to be able to plug it in as part of the jigsaw. But we're really in, in the beginning right now. And the first thing we tested out was the human dynamics piece around trust. Uh, we went through the conscious contract clinic as well. And we decided actually to re, rename ourselves after that. And we went from um, collaborating as a group of, as a bigger group to looking at how do we collaborate in triads um, and really build trust and, and look at um, relationships in a whole different way. So there are three really big components. It's the, it's the self-track, the creation pods, um, and the marketplace. And then we would also like to have physical locations where people can come in community, um, whether full-time or part-time, and um, be able to have a place to go to um, and create together. What are some obstacles that you see, some things that might push back or get, get in the way? We're the biggest obstacle. We, you know, we're, we're, we're the biggest obstacle of getting in our own way because everything we need is here. Um, we just, you know, being able to access it, you know, like right now I've been thinking about how much I would like to have an illustrator on board. And um, because I think like for a lot of people, um, the visuals become more important, especially at a younger age. And so I could sit here and think, you know, as, with my old corporate hat about, you know, how do I find an illustrator? And instead I have to get out of my way and say, who's an illustrator? <laughs> and so I think, I think often, um, what I've been training myself to do since for the last 15 years is every time I see an obstacle or a roadblock I say what's the opportunity and for me personally it's it's been also about understanding what's healthy and unhealthy for me not what's right or wrong not what appropriate or inappropriate not what good or bad but what is healthy or unhealthy and so some people that I've tried to play with were very unhealthy for me. So I walked away and sometimes I ran. And you might love them. They might be fantastic partners for you, but for me, they're not. And people around told me like, well, you got to suck it up. And I'm like, no, in my world, there's not that anymore. And so the obstacles are, are really our own because we create this complexity when, um, you know, if you look at it, if you go out to nature, like if you look at anything in, around you, everything came from nature. Like, and so when you understand like how abundant things are, and I'm not going into the woo woo abundant scarcity thing, but like, you know, just how much we have access to and how blessed we are. Like, I, I feel grateful every day that I can choose because 2022 is all about choices. And I can choose to live this lifestyle. That is a gift that many people don't have. And as I go out in the world and I talk to young people and, and people, older people, you know, there's a spark there that's waiting to be ignited. And so the obstacles are, you know, maybe, um, <laughs> you know, being able to get to as many people. Like I feel like with these books, I have medicine for the soul. But the question is, how do I get them to the people that are ready and are waiting? And then how do I get the other books? You know, it's really interesting. I've been talking to this new company that just came up and uh, we're probably going to be launching a thematic uh, book club where we will be able to get other books together and have conversations about them. So, you know, Two weeks ago, I couldn't talk to you about it, but today I can talk to you about it. And then we can create different ways based on these other things that are popping up and connect them um, in, in, in more um, heartfelt ways. What part of your vision are you confident um, about that you actually feel a sense of, aha, time is right. Um, this is gonna uh, come to fruition. All of it, <laughs> all of it, yeah, because we're doing it. 
we 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 are we were born for this we were born to be here we were born to have these conversations and to get off our asses and go create what the hell are we here for to sit around and judge and shame and blame who has who has patience for any of that bullshit um so i think that that's a that's a that's a good way um, for me to shut up, and there are a few hands up in terms of people who have some questions. So, um, so you you um, you mentioned the book publishing business and how unhappy you were with them. Um, Jose and I just wrote the book and and understand perfectly what you mean. So, why don't you describe you know in a few words what is it like now and what it would be in 2045 and just use your imagination. Sure, I, I mean, book publishing has become now a requirement for anybody as an entrepreneur. They, they any entrepreneur believes that if they write the book then they'll get the speaking gigs and blah, 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 blah all these stories that were told. And they're finding that that's not true. And, you know, there's a whole industry around how to be a best selling author and how to, you know, get on Amazon. But, you know, what most people don't understand is that everybody's a best selling author. So, in a world with the best, <laughs> how do we get the information that we want? And in 2019, um, I went to this um, writers conference in San Francisco. Um, and I started asking people in the publishing uh, space, how do we change the categories? Like I'm writing books, but I don't believe in self-help. So how do we change the categories? And I got the same answers that I got in business, which is suck it up. This is how we do it, you know? And I don't wanna suck it up anymore. And, you know, it's been it's been wonderful because my first two books, my, my third one just came out, but my first two books, <coughs> you know, won, won awards in like visionary nonfiction and all this stuff, but it still doesn't get to the people who need them. So in 2045, that ability to not just be about the books, but to be about what are we creating in the world and understanding that we have, like how does medicine get dispensed right now through force? <laughs> um, so imagine that we didn't have to, to force it or it wasn't like the most popular thing. I mean, even, even many of these clubs that are being formed, they come through celebrities, but who creates celebrities? And so right now, if, if, if somebody comes out and says, oh my God, that person gave $5 billion and everybody's like going, oh, wow, isn't that person amazing? My question is, isn't that our money? Who are we celebrating? What the fuck? You know, like this is, this is insanity. And so in 2045, if we can go back to writing, like I learned from Seth Godin that writer's block is a man-made invention. Have any of you ever heard of chef's block? <laughs> Have you ever seen a chef in the kitchen just blocked? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 laughing because I've always felt the same way about writer's block and you know you're looking at someone who's published four or five books and I completely agree with you and I have a really interesting um uh view of intellectual property in books it's these are things that come through me and the the concept of ownership of of the the intellectual property is just it 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 it's incongruent with with my whole belief system. And yeah, I love the idea of just getting stuff out there. Um, Mark, you have a question. I'm still so curious, hold on, hold on. I'm so curious about, so what would that look like, the distribution, you know, giving that away to more people or having more people access it, or what would that look like? Did you, I, think, I think we need to create, I think we need to create a new system of value exchange that we don't have you know, that takes in, okay. you know, that game takes in all these little pieces that we have all over the place. Like we've got the gifting economy, we got the gaming, we got this, this and the, that. And what we forgot about okay. is, is the value exchange. And I don't believe in, in free models because, you know, we've been duped and seduced by free models because we've been giving our data and information for free, thinking that, 
all this stuff is free when it's not. And so I think any human being that offers something, there needs to be some kind of value exchange that happens. And, and so we have to mm -hmm. redefine freedom. Like yesterday I was meeting with someone and she was telling me this amazing idea that she had and she wanted to do this free thing in real estate. And this morning she sent me a text. She said, you know, I realized that it's not free. It's future entrepreneurs in real estate. And so that value exchange of when you understand, and you guys wrote a brilliant book. I loved your book, by the way, I read it. Um, when, oh, when, when, when you, when you um, put together the, the, the ability to have value and, and, you know, people are like, thank you for your time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like th these are the, the small changes that we need to make in our day-to-day -day life and with ourselves. And so when we start doing that and we start setting those expectations for ourselves and each other, then we'll create these value exchanges and we'll say, you know what, I'll give you this for that. And I'm really looking for this. I have this. This is so valuable. It's not about pitching the book. Like I, I wrote a blog post about pitching. Like no one who has any one of you ever bought anything in an elevator? <laughs> you're, 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 in, you're inspiring to listen to, Ayala, in terms of, you know, the human connection at some level in terms of the, the value exchange. Well, it's exactly what 2045 is about, making sure that visionaries doing great work in the world start to know about um, each other. And, and no doubt, um, Ayala, that's what your new platform is about also. So Thank you. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I'm always thrilled to meet people who understand the power of conversation. Um, I'm uh, really curious. You mentioned 7% seven, 7 of the people on the planet. Where does that figure come from? And I have a follow-up on that once you answer that. I had a really funny conversation about this yesterday. This is why I'm laughing. So. I, I'm actually a, a PhD dropout. Um, I, I, my, my, my plan was to be to teach. And then I was very close to completing my PhD and I, I fired myself from it. And uh, I moved into working in market research and doing public opinion polls and really understanding about listening and creating conversations and looking at trends and not just on the political spectrum, but the environment and retail. And, you know, I went to did a study of 2,500 human resource professionals, um, which I'm still traumatized by. And, um, <laughs> and it can happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I moved into doing like global strategy and, um, you know, I've been working as a futurist as well, looking at the future of humanity. Um, and I just did a lot of research and I think before 2019 hit, um, for me, the number was at 5%. Um, I think it's really at 11%, but I'm staying at 7% and it's just coming through me mm -hmm. that there are hundreds of millions of people on this planet that have stepped into a healthy timeline that do want dialogue, conversation, connection, and trust and community. And we are starting to find each other. This is why I love what, what you're doing here. And I think like we're all doing it together. Mm -hmm. And imagine, imagine, let's say there, there's a billion people, which is way higher than the 7% or half a billion people that are on the same track as us. What is possible when we stop fighting when we stop protesting, when we stop signing petitions and we start living our truth by the choices that we're making. And I'm not calling for a revolution. I'm talking about how do we holistically become true to ourselves and stop fighting? Because all these things, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're against or pro something, in my world, there are no sides. And, you know, I come from war. <laughs> uh, I come from, you know, much persecution in, in, in my ancestry. But in my world today, there are no sides. And if you're on a side, that's fantastic. So the people that are really um, in this percentage, whatever it is, 
If you have a book and you think that there's 180 million people on this timeline, or if you think there's 10 million people on this timeline, how many of these people do you want to impact in your lifetime? Mm -hmm. Even 0.01% is significant. Mm -hmm. And so we need to start looking at things from a different way, which is why I'm using percentages. Because the question is, is what's the impact? And if you just want to grow your own garden and live a healthy life, that's enough. You don't have to go revolutionize education. You don't have to do anything else. We need healthy people on this planet that are thriving, not suffering. And to me, that's the shift. The, the shift into the, the non-suffering. And if we start, I, I use the percentage because of my background, because that's what people like to talk about. And then they like to go into the math and I go, wait. And then they tell me, Ayala, you're being conservative. It's a much bigger number. I, the reason it caught me, my attention is, um... I think it's about 13 years old now, but Robert Keegan and Elise Leahy at Harvard have wrote a book called The Immunity to Change. And they look at uh, subject-object relations. And the number of people, and this is based mostly on college student surveys, it's not representative of the larger population. They see the number of people who are actually between self-transforming and uh, self-authoring and self-transforming mind is right around 7%. These are folks who can look at the mindsets and the worldviews that were instilled in them and say, you know what, I'm not buying all that. It's stepping outside and saying, this is a lens just like these glasses. And wow, there's whole other things out here I can look at, right? So it just caught my attention. And um, I think it's probably a larger number. And I think if we include indigenous peoples, and there's still millions of them around the planet, the number shoots way up because they have a very different way of, of approaching things than we do. So I'm, I'm right there. Let's have these conversations. Thank you, you bring something really important that I love is that, you know, we're here to break the cycles. You know, we've seen the movies, we've seen the sequels. We even have mini series right now. I got the t-shirts. They're all worn out. <laughs> <laughs> but the oppressed become the oppressors. And, and that is the piece that we really need to look at. This is why I love Stewart's poems as well, because they get right into the heart of things and, and what Jose talks about force. And the more that we can get in touch with ourselves, I think that's the most important work right now because, and, and I would love to see with um, some of the things that you're doing in society 2045 as well is the future of humanity. Because if we leave it to, to these institutions, they have no interest. I mean, we have a major conflict happening right now. Um, and, and, you know, we forgot that we pay taxes. And what are we paying taxes for? Because we're so busy. You know, did we get our, our systems in place? Like, we, we, we're so focused on the mechanics. And if you look at work, the focus is really on the mechanics but what about the dynamics? And what we need is the harmony between the dynamics and the mechanics. So somebody can put on a Zoom, right? That's the mechanics. But if somebody's not driving the conversation, like if you, if you came into a room and you were invited to a room and there were 11 chairs in there and everybody showed up and nobody knew what to do, <laughs> Right. And what we've done with the Internet and what we've done online, which we can um, Matt, to your question, which we could move in leaps in 2045 is say, how do we create something that we need? What we've done is we've replicated the current world online and that doesn't work. That's insane. Um, thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Ayelette. Um, I, it's been a real pleasure listening to you for this last hour. Um, I know how much we are in sync because we've had so many conversations and uh, I've really loved, but um, I must admit that something that came out in a different way for me today in listening to you um, is how, how much you are in tune with the fact that we need to do this as individuals and how much of it is about empowering and feeling empowered in ourselves and helping to connect one another. And 
the attitude of, well, fuck all the other stuff. Um, it resonated with me today more so than it has in our conversations. And I think, I think I feel it, um, but I don't always express it in the same way that you have today. Um, so I'll, I always say it's a question, not a statement. So here's my question and I'll, I'll uh, shut up. Um, how do you see us, the us, the broader us, those, those 7% um, finding each other in a way that doesn't become mechanical, that doesn't become systematized in a way that draws us back into the system? I think this is a great example of it you know, and it's, it's about moving out of the transaction. So we have an hour here where we're, we're bound by the mechanics that we created. We said this was going to be an hour. We had an agreement and what happens after that hour? You know, I had a call with a guy, I, I don't know, six months ago. And I said, wow, that's amazing what you're working on, but has this been a total waste of my time? Because what are we going to do moving forward together? And he was like, I never thought about that. And I said, well, I am choosing consciously not to get on calls anymore and just have like introductions. Um, I am committing to doing something um, and it doesn't have to be big as we move forward. And I think that's what it is. I mean, you know, you, you can look at your calendar. We've become slaves to what shows up or, you know, somebody asking us for a call here and a call there. But instead of a call, instead of that transaction, your work and your book about purpose of, okay, so we're going to spend this time together, even if it's just exploring or experimenting, let's put it on the table. And if it goes nowhere, that's fine. But let's, let's be honest. Let's start practice some radical honesty of not needing to tell our entire life story and say, okay, what are we creating together? Like what's exciting? And then through it, get to know each other as well and really bring in that humanity because our hearts get full. And I think that what you're doing, what, what um, uh, the folks I'm working with are doing, my, my dream is that we all focus on the flourishing of life and we bring it together and we say, okay, we're working on this piece, you're working on this piece, how do we build this piece together? Because it's truly about trekking into the unknown and having the heart set of an adventurer of saying, okay, we don't, what do I know? Like, you know, some days I, I say to people, I don't know anything, like <laughs> I'm just creating here. And so, you know, even just in this conversation, we have somebody who's done a ton in this space and a ton and someone who has this passion for education so why are we doing all this stuff in isolation why are we putting more names i, I would like to li live in a world with no advertised branding or marketing <laughs> because we're talking about what matters and so when I think about someone in education or someone who is going to teach me about food as medicine I know who to go to and that I make a choice not to poison my body with things that cause cancer because I become aware that there are all these products on the market that if I put under my arm and I look at the percentage of breast cancer among men and women, not just women in the world, is on an increase because we don't know what we're consuming. And everybody, you know, $450 billion beauty industry, we can't look at ourselves unless we look in a mirror, unless we see a reflection in a window, or we're on a Zoom now. But beauty is here. And so how do we co-create? How do we have the difficult situations and at the end of a call and say, wow, you're, you're fucking amazing. But what do you want to do together? And it's hard. I mean, Stuart asked about obstacles. It takes a lot of rewiring. You know, I want to live in a world where we don't have to have these contracts for the lowest common denominator, because that's what we created the law around. 
We didn't create the, the, the law for the highest common denominator. Our whole definition of safety has to change. I, I, um, I think that's the perfect note to kind of bring this formal part um, of this talk to an end. The, the critical nature of what is it that we want to create together and, and, and also to punctuate something you said, we don't have a resource problem on this planet, we just have a distribution. And I think we're all working at it. And so um, the key thing is for you to continue to do what you're doing. Um, this has been a wonderful hour. So blessings and safe trekking. Thank you. Thank you for, for creating this for us. Thank you for sharing. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank too. you.